Uh, thank you so much for joining today and uh, welcome back to Mantisa data science webinars and meetups. We had taken a small break uh, since for the last few months because of the COVID situation in the country. Uh, and today I'm really uh, glad to be restarting this again with uh, a really distinguished guest with us, so uh, Mirza Rahim, uh, who has agreed to do this fireside chat with me today. Uh, I'll quickly start off with an introduction uh, about him, and then I'll let him introduce himself, and then we'll take this conversation ahead. So Mirza Rahim, uh, he has a bachelor's in electronics and communication from BITS, and he did his master's degree uh, in data science from Liverpool John Muse University. Uh, he was at He's been in many different companies. He's worked at IMS Health. He was at Flipkart for about five and a half years, where he was a business analyst and then uh, analytics lead. Uh, and now he's working uh, at Zalando SE as the lead analyst. He is actively involved in teaching and uh, mentoring students and uh, has been part of many uh, online tech content videos as well. Uh, thank you, Mirza, for, uh, Mirza Rahim for agreeing to do this talk with us today. Uh, I, can you maybe perhaps introduce yourself and uh, let the audience know a little bit more about yourself? Sure. Yep. Thank you for having me. And it's nice to be here on this platform and finally interacting with more people after a long time. So that's really good. Um, I'll again, briefly introduce myself as well. So my name is Mirza Rahim Beg, and I'm used to being called all three of them, although the primary is actually Rahim. So that's what I prefer, but anything is fine. Um, and uh, I have, to summarize, right? I've been working in the data science field or data-related roles for 11 years plus. It's been called different things, so I don't want to get into the, those, but uh, been close to data, close to problem solving and impacts for 11 years plus now. And uh, I started in electronics. Uh, I was in an electronics company. Slowly, I made a move. I made moved towards consulting, then uh, Flipkart. And now I'm at uh, Zalando here in Berlin. Uh, and like Imad mentioned, other than the job that I do, I also am very involved in uh, teaching. I have been involved in teaching for multiple ed tech platforms. Uh, my, I, you probably find me there in some content videos here and there or some YouTube stuff and so on. Other than that, I've also been fortunate to work on two books so far, which are one, has, one was launched last year sometime mid. And another one is going to be launched soon. So one was on deep learning, the other on marketing, and so on. So, yeah. So that's that's about me. Uh, yeah. Sure. Great, great having you, Rahim. Uh, I, I'm sure the audience, the listeners, will benefit a lot from your experience. And uh, as we've already discussed uh, earlier, and let everyone know that we'll be today. Today we'll be talking about business problem solving in the first part of the session, and the second part of the session is more going to be focused more towards. Uh, uh, making a career in data science. So we, these are the broad two themes that we will be covering today. So let me just dive right into the first part of this uh, discussion today, right? So uh, what do you, in what is what is problem solving in your mind, and how do you, how do you solve problems, right? Right. So what what is the definition of problem solving for you? So, so to begin, right, I would like to say that you know, even before I go into defining things and so on, uh, this is one area which is, I believe, a critical area now. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, the gap here in industry, right, of people who are good problem solvers mm -hmm. is increasing significantly. You know, you, you have plenty of good technical people, plenty of folks who sure. are good at the models and so on, but this is something where there is a huge gap. And this is why I feel uh, talking about this is very important. Mm -hmm. right? So the business problem solving aspect, which is over, often ignored, but is a very, very important one. Right? So now, I talk about what it is, right? And before going into the solving part, let's mm -hmm. talk about what the business problem is. Yeah. Because I think that that definition really uh, matters a lot. And I, I don't mean a theoretical definition really, but what I mean is, uh, you know, what do we understand when we say business problem, right? Yeah. And uh, the way at least I think of it is that a business problem could be any, say, short or mid or long, doesn't matter, but mm -hmm. it could be a challenge or opportunity or aspiration a company could be having, mm -hmm. right? So it doesn't really have to be some something broken, right? Some 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 problem as such, which is you know high red red alert or whatever, right? It's just it could be an aspiration as well, and solving that, right? If that can produce a tangible result for the business, mm -hmm. that is what we mean by a business problem. Okay, so essentially, 
it could be short long whatever term it mm -hmm. could be an aspiration it could be an opportunity or uh, it could just be an actual problem or something is broken right in fixing that and this in this in this broad definition of big definition right there's a lot of other aspects as well right uh, it could be about mitigating the risk it could uh, that it doesn't have to be an explicit realized problem as well right it could just be uh, something uh, let's say which is uh, some sub optimality which you have identified in your systems right uh, it could it could or it could just be you know a, a strategic decision that the organization is taking uh, an example could be that you know the company is doing pretty well let's talk of an e-commerce company e-commerce company is doing very very well but of late right uh, you believe that there is a lot of attention uh, to sustainability mm -hmm. right to sustainable materials and you know the global uh, warming and impact on the environment and so on right and uh, you know as a, as a maybe a, a leader as a as a organization who's leading this domain or in, in this industry or as just you know what you would want to do you probably want to make your business more sustainable right? yeah so that could be a strategic goal that could be like a just a, just a goal for you right and that and enabling that itself could be thought of as a business problem right so the idea is that there's many ways to look at a business problem but any any of these things right it could be a risk or a priority or or or, or an aspiration any of these could be a business problem and the key thing is resolving this or solutioning of this should result in some tangible benefits for the organization okay, okay. So that's the first part <laughs> that's that's the, the whole business so and um, yeah so uh, that I hope, I hope that answers your question about what business problem yeah so i mean I, I what i get from that is it necessarily isn't something that is a problem per se problem in the in the sense of the word where something is an issue it's not an issue but it's it may it can be an opportunity it can be uh, a way to take your organization from one level to another and exactly. i think steve jobs did that a lot right like he used to envision a future where we could do certain things and he used to take that as a business opportunity and yes. again call it a business problem and then try and get that resolved i mean exactly. of course that was more towards how uh, he would get things to be developed but here we're talking in the context of data but uh, similar thoughts like where you see your business going in the future and then you are you're framing that as a problem and trying to solve that yes okay definitely. so so how, what are the key areas that you think one should focus when they're trying to solve a problem right how, how do you how do they identify what is more important while trying to solve this problem so i think this let me just think over the question so you mean uh, when so you, what when, so when, yeah, when you're trying to solve a problem what what are you looking at uh, and what what is okay so how do you break it down into pieces that you can manage uh -huh. right okay okay so like an overall approach yeah the way to solving the problem that uh yeah so i think this is this is one this is the kind of question where um you know if if you go to the internet right you uh, or you just study some course or whatever you have many many frameworks right. in fact even i <laughs> teach uh, a course on business problem solving and uh, and i am also guilty of teaching these frameworks but um they help and they do help in some yeah. uh, some way right but uh, i'll talk of you know not talk of the frameworks here what i talk of is a general common sense approach really sure okay and uh, what really happens is over the years uh, over different industries and domains people develop their own distinct ways of how they work how they go about this and this may or may not fit any framework theory right so uh, but at least how how i uh, approach this is uh, there are steps right in in uh, solving any problem right uh, the first part like the problem definition part Like for for some reason, let's assume that the problem definition part is done, meaning that uh, you know the aspiration or whatever it has come to us, you know maybe we were part of the definition, but let's say the definition is defined for for a moment. Yeah. The next step is uh, understanding the problem, mm -hmm. and this is one of those critical steps in my mind. Really, even before thinking of the data, even before thinking about how you solve it eventually, right? Do do you understand the problem well enough to formulate it? Uh, you know formulate uh, it as a data problem whatever right the first step is that what is the root cause can you get there what is your understanding of it right uh, maybe talk to business at this stage maybe because they probably have some perspective even if they are not like very data in, uh, informed 
but they would definitely have some very very strong hypotheses as to you know what is potentially wrong right so that is the first step really uh, collecting all you can about the business problem itself and understanding the nature of the beast you're dealing with that's step number 1 and this is a step where like i mentioned you do a lot of exploratory analysis maybe you talk to a lot of people and gather all you can once you have a solid understanding of the business problem itself then you go towards say the whole uh, maybe that's when you realize okay you know even if i have to solve this doesn't matter what method i use eventually but what kind of information what kind of data do i need to be mm-hmm. even beginning to solve this right so the second part is that this whole data uh, understanding bit and my data i mean you could look at see existing reports you could look at some say existing dashboards or it could also be collecting a lot of data yourself or in fact in some cases it would also be you know that we need to solve this problem it uh, it but we are not ready for it and 3 months down the line we'll have to pick this up so i want to start tracking this right mm-hmm. so there's a lot of uh, aspects how, involved in this whole data I, I, i have a related question there how important do you think is stakeholder alignment uh, on the business problem oh wow so that it's very good you asked this i was going to talk about that in a, in a good a focused manner a little later but stakeholder alignment and um, how you formulate the problem itself so by formulate i mean um, in fact this is this is the part where you should pick a problem right so in any organization you have no dearth of problems yeah you you go to you go to any organization you ask you know what what are problems you want to solve and they'll give you a big list yeah. top of mind they will have a dozen things in their head which they want to be solving so how do you get that how do you identify the problems to solve right and this this whole bit about uh, stakeholder alignment uh, finding the key stakeholders them being aligned the sponsors uh, who will sponsor the project mm-hmm. their priorities all of this plays a very significant role the project which will get prioritized out of the 10 projects which are you know in in consideration will be the project which has a, a good amount of let's say a strong sponsor that okay we want to get this done and we will sponsor the activities on this uh, the project which has uh, in a goal set in mind it is solvable really and uh, you have say very clearly shown a plan that these are the metrics i will eventually affect and if you have a, some sort of an estimate that you know top line or bottom line this is a difference i will make that is the project which will get prioritized okay, so there's this whole identification of the right problem itself right has is is a very uh, involved topic by itself and a uh, lot of lot of discussion can happen in that track actually mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that's where the stakeholder alignment comes in yeah okay but yeah but after that right that after that whole first part uh, is when you go towards this understanding the business a little better uh, the, the context a little better and come up with hypotheses right and then you mm-hmm. go back to this whole process of solving it in a way and in that like i was saying right you begin the understanding the business then you go towards the data understanding part then you do you do the actual you know data exploration data preparation collection merging joining or whatever right this this is where the actual hands on part really really begins hmm. finally or not finally the penultimate step in a way is uh, that whole data modeling part and by modeling i don't mean statistical modeling really it is essentially making a solution based on data and uh, in some cases it could be uh, a state of the art uh, latest model or in some cases it could be a very simple nicely done pivot table in excel or sometimes it could just be a nice visualization you do on the map of the country mm-hmm. so all of these are valid solutions yeah and uh, after the solution is made uh, important stuff is ma- uh, validating the solution and once you have validated it you go towards the deployment and deployment here i don't necessarily mean deploying on some clusters or whatever but it essentially means getting people to act on it or making it live in some or the other way that's that's i would say the process that i typically try to follow sure yeah uh, thanks so much for the detailed answer so when you were mentioning about identifying the problem and then doing the stakeholder alignment and then mm-hmm. uh, understanding the data and then again data modeling 
and deploying and making the solution useful. So while you're trying to understand the business problem, are you also thinking about possible solutions or are you keeping these two separate? So in your mind, is, are these two things separate or are they happening simultaneously? Mm, no. So in my mind, uh, the order is important. So focus, at least the most important part really is the defi defining the problem part, right? How you, what is the problem? Uh, what is a measure of success, right? Uh, what is the potential impact? That That is a part which is separate. Uh, which solution do I use is a very, very later thing in my mind. Uh, and uh, unless you do the first part right, which is which is def defining the problem very well and having good hypotheses in mind, the part later will not will never be well. Even if you do like if you do the best job on the later part without doing the first part well, it won't really get you anywhere. Hmm. So that's the first part. Focus on that. Uh, spend significant energy on it. Have all the alignments you need. Uh, ask for all the resources you need. Right. Arrange for it. Then when you have those, in this process also you will realize the constraints which will be applicable to your solution. Sure. And these constraints play a big, big role. Only after you have these constraints uh, explicit, right? You, that you know you have to have a real-time solution or whatever, right? Only then you can think of the solution which fit under those constraints, right? So it's a, it's a later stage in my mind. Mm -hmm. Sure. I mean, I think this is a deviation from uh, the way an engineer thinks, right? Like the engineer always has a solution in mind first, and then he's looking for problems. So he, he thinks his modeling technique is the best technique in the world. And then he's looking for a problem that can fit that solution. <laughs> so that's how an engineer usually thinks. He's, he's solution first. He's like, I know how to solve this. I know how to implement this. Now, what problem is there that can uh, take this solution? I mean, yeah. and, and I think this is all, uh, this is how many engineers start off in the industry as well. I mean, that's how our education system also teaches us different techniques that we can use and all of that. I mean, you know that all courses are yeah. focused on that, right? So. I think, uh, I don't know if there's anyone to blame for that, but then that, that thought process is something that is uh, very dominant in the initial years. But then as, as you go further in your career, then you start realizing that, hey, problem solving is a big aspect that you need to understand and solve for first. I mean, rather, I mean, I say solve for, uh, like you said, right, uh, to be able to identify, have metrics, and then uh, what, what does success mean for this project, right? So if... If that is really well defined, then does your solution really matter in the context of the business, or else it's it's just a solution that you hope would work, but it may not have a solution. Uh, it might not really tangibly contribute to the uh, business. True. And in fact, this is all too common. Actually, uh, this is what you mentioned, right? About uh, people putting effort into a solution, or uh, you know, already putting effort into a solution, and some people coming up with the best kind of model and then seeing you know who will benefit or who will let's say sponsor my project right that happens and that is one of the key reasons many of these uh, projects also fail uh, because the 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 objectives the outcomes are depend all of these need to be need to be defined first yeah. in a good manner only then you move towards the actual solving but if you start working the other way maybe you're lucky in some situations it may yeah. work but in general that is setting up for failure yeah yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, I mean, again, bringing to that, that uh, taking away from that point, right? Like now we understand that this business problem solving or uh, context setting is really important to be able to uh, contribute uh, mm -hmm. in, in an efficient way, in a way that uh, really has some tangible results. Yeah. So how can somebody uh, who has started off or who's been in the industry for a few years uh, understand or gain this skill, right? To be able to uh, really contribute in a way that they are able to formulate these business problems? How can they uh, get that skill set where they are able to do, find this uh, problem or rather get this problem out of whatever is happening around them and uh, are able to then get that uh, resolved and then go for the solutioning bit? OK. So if I just try to summarize, right? if you're talking about how does one identify the right problem yeah. to solve, yeah. That, yeah. that's it, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's it's as much as an art, I suppose, right? Um, yeah. And um, so, what is your uh, what is yeah. your cheat code? Sure, sure. But but yeah, again, this is not something which can't be taught or you know can't be learned, right? There are a few things, a few things really, which which definitely should happen, or this is how you 
this should be your criteria for identifying um, a, a good project to solve right first of all it should be say closely aligned with the priorities of the organization that you're working with and the priorities of the key sponsor that's very very important right someone has to sponsor what you're doing and if the sponsor doesn't feel what you're doing is important good luck with getting anywhere right so what do you that's mean by sponsor thing. here what do you mean by sponsor so oh, so uh, by sponsor so how we should think of it is that any organization yeah. right and yeah. i'll take the example of uh, of uh, I mean, the simplest way to uh, explain I think this there's is a, the there's a question on the Q and A. Would you mind talking about a real world problem from Zalando? Maybe you can talk in the e-commerce context a little bit here, yeah. Uh, while yeah, while you're trying to formulate this answer. Sure, sure. So, so it's like this. Um, in general, analytics or data science teams will be working along with some other teams who will do the implementation in a way. So, my, what what I mean by that? Let's say. Uh, the marketing team wants uh, some 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 good model or s some solution right to help identify the right customers for the right marketing campaigns right and let's say you believe that you can solve that using uh, whatever solutions you have right let's say some some latest model or whatever right doesn't matter uh, and the the marketing team therefore the business team in question or or the product team in question they need to some of some some of them will be in a way sponsoring your efforts. So see, this this is very very simple to understand in the case of a client uh, consultant relationship yeah, because yeah. right uh, the, you the consultant is on the pay, in a way being paid by the client to do whatever the client wants to do, right. Sure. That's the simplest way to explain this. Uh, sure. Unless the client who's the sponsor feels this is important, you won't be working on it. Simple as that. Uh, in in organizations where you are an in-house analyst or an in-house data scientist, it's not very obvious, yeah. but you still will have some org towards which your cost will be built. And that org needs to feel whatever you're doing is a priority for them. Only oh. then will this, the so staffing, everything will happen only after that, right? Sure. That's what I mean by this. Okay. This is the first criterion, really. Uh, it needs to be aligned with the objectives of the business and the key sponsors, right? It should be sure. about the priorities. Uh, the next uh, criterion should be, uh, can you somehow estimate the potential impact? Mm -hmm. And obviously, people would prefer something which has a higher potential impact, right? So let's say there are two people, uh, one one team lead comes with, you know, I, we will make this model, this, that, and so on, um, and this will be great. I can't give you a number, but it will be great. Whereas the second person comes in with, with a modest but actionable plan that, okay, this is what I'll do. This is the kind of uh, approach we have. And we uh, can estimate, let's say, you know, uh, let's say, I don't know, $100,000 on the, on, the, on the bottom line, for example, in, in, in a quarter. Mm -hmm. right? Of course, the second one has a higher chance of being uh, selected or prioritized. So having a, a potential impact estimated helps a lot. So pick problems where you can quantify things better or the sure. outcome, right? That is another one, big one. Uh, the third thing is uh, the um, dependencies. Uh, some projects, this is this is how, what, how it happens, right? In practice, mm -hmm. that the higher the number of dependencies, the higher the risk. Right? Yeah. So of course, you may want to prefer picking problems in which you have a little more control, right? And you can in influence the solution a little better, right? That's 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 another one. And finally, I mean, just, just as a mental thing, right, which is pretty useful sometimes is that maybe you can make a, uh, like, a like a grid, like a, like how you do, right? Like a two by two or BCG or whatever, right? On one axis, you have uh, the effort. On the other axis, you have the potential impact, right? And uh, you have things which are low effort and low impact, maybe not the best. But if you have some things which are low effort and high impact, which could you could think of their low hanging fruits, right? Maybe you want to prioritize that first, right? And if you also want to pick these larger problems, which are like research problems and, and, and so on, where you engage or solve deeply, you can take those high effort and high impact ones and phase them out and you keep working on them in the background. So this is just another simple way to evaluate problems. Using all of these, you can, this probably will, I hope this gives you some sense, you know, that there's some conditions which, which make a project an attractive project for analytics to pick up. 
or data science teams to pick up, right? And notice that in this whole thing, I did not talk about the actual modeling technique because that should not be a criterion in this whole thing. Sure, uh, absolutely right. Like it's it's like like you mentioned earlier, the problem framing part is independent of the solutioning part, and then. Uh, in the problem framing part, like I said, you need to have close integration with your business and yes. uh, alignment with the key sponsor. Uh, are you able to estimate the impact and try, are you able to find the problems that have uh, perhaps low effort and high uh, high ROI? So maybe I think these are key points uh, while trying to decide what problems to solve. And, and like you said, uh, the solutioning part is separate. So how would you... Uh, think about that. So now that you have defined the problem, uh, let's say you've been able to do that. So how how do you start thinking about solution, creating solutions for these? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, again, this is a very important question, and um, it's, I think most of the audience should also be aware that these days uh, in in data science interviews or data science related roles interviews, you do have special rounds around problem solving. Mm -hmm. So just just FYI, this is a pretty important skill, and uh, you all should pay attention. So. Uh, specifically now talking about uh, finding the right solution for the business problem which has been identified right or prioritized first of all it's it's very very important you have the right analytical or data science objective mm -hmm. uh, by that i mean let's say as an example um, business wants to say um, Identify, for example, let's say, let's take a simple example. Identify sure. customers who may uh, churn or, or prevent churn, basically, from an e-commerce context, right? Um, churn of e-commerce or whatever. From it could be it's a general kind of a context actually, but sure. yeah, churn. So, as an analytical or as a data science uh, solution or solver, sorry, uh, you have to pick the objective which is aligned in a way. So, meaning that. Um, Whatever you do, it, it still doesn't matter what the details are at the moment, right? Whatever mm -hmm. you do, you should have it very, very clear. The solution I build eventually should be helping me get towards that. Identify customers who are likely to churn, for example, and also recommend something to do about it. For example, if you make a state-of-the-art model, which has very, very high chances of very, very high accuracy in predicting who may churn, let's say, uh, one month on the but you have no idea what drives it. You have no idea how to work on it, mm. right? Or you have no recommendation to give to the business eventually. Then it's not really solving much. Okay. So often there could be a layer on top of it. You know that there's a model. It's fine, but I also this is what I really need as an outcome. What will really help as an output is not model, not some predictions, not maybe some probabilities. But what I need is something on which the business or the marketing teams can action on, right? And these recommendations are what my output really is. So hmm. your objective should be making those recommendations and not having a model. That's the first thing. Then the second thing is, which is very, very important, which somehow is always, not always, often missed is, you have to be really mindful of the constraints which are coming in from business and, the, and anyone, all the three stakeholders basically. Right, and there are many, many constraints which can come in. Mm -hmm. Your solution or the problem you're solving, right, or whatever, it could be a short-term solve, it could be a long-term solve, or it could be just a one-time thing which you're just patching or making, fixing some broken thing, or it could be some continuous kind of thing. Let's say, let's talk. Of, let's say a recommendation system, right? When you go to Amazon, it's not a one-time model. It's a it's a model which will be evolving every quarter, maybe, right? And there's a dozens of versions of it already, right? It's a continuous thing. You will never say that I have my recommendation thing is solved, right? So short term versus long term, one time versus a continuous improvement kind of thing. Uh, let's say offline, let's say implementation of it versus let's say uh, online real time or near real time kind of a, uh, predictions, right? Whatever. There are many, many constraints which come uh, in, in, in the from the context, the business and uh, the whole environment. Really. And if your solution does not respect those constraints, then again, it is setting it up for failure, right? And this, then you, I think you've heard of this famous example, right? Um, of, of this whole Netflix, the first time the someone 
won the challenge in a way, right? 10% delta from their old recommendation system model, right? Several years back. Solution number one, which was a top solution, which won a million dollars, yeah. was not a feasible solution. They just could not implement it, right? Solution number two, which was 8% or something better maybe, but not 10%, it was a good enough solution that went uh, live in a way. Mm -hmm. right? So best accuracy, you know, one million dollars, but didn't really solve anything. Yeah. Yeah. So that's just an example, yeah? And so this, this is another thing, be mindful of the constraints. And who consumes these outputs of your, uh, of your uh, solution uh, will have a big role to play. I can give you one simple example because people are asking about examples from my own uh, experience recently maybe. So this example is not very old, it's somewhat decent. And there was this, this project which was uh, about something to do with customer behavior and the kind of impact uh, our interventions have on customer behavior, customer journey, right? And long-term behavior, short-term behavior. We didn't know this, it was a very, very open-ended question. But it was something uh, all the you know, high, uh, big guys were in, very interested in, you know, because it was going to affect our investment decisions. So, and here is what happened in this case. Uh, coincidentally, there were two teams. Uh, one was mm -hmm. the, the, me and there was another team who were interested in this problem. And we kind of decided to collaborate on this and take two different tracks because in the situation it made sense. And uh, the other team, uh, they, we were really ambitious in this, in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, they felt, you know, let's let's do this. Uh, they talked to a lot of uh, decision scientists, data scientists, and this whole team got together. They said, you know, this can be nicely formulated. It naturally, it is a reinforcement learning problem. Okay. You, know, you, you do this, you do this, you know, we can have all these tapes and so on. And they went ahead on that tangent. Mm -hmm. For me, it was very clear that the consumers of this are going to be top business folks. Mm -hmm. heads of a particular category or heads of a particular business unit and so on. And for them, right, whatever output I have, it should be something which is easy to understand, yeah. something which they trust, right? So it spawned off two different tracks. Very soon, within two months, the other track met a dead end mm -hmm. because it just wasn't feasible. Whatever they're looking to do, the data, the scale, the volumes, plus the interpretability of it was not really going anywhere. And the simple approach which I had in mind, you know, uh, which kept it very, very simple deliberately, really. And the output of it, by the way, looked like a table, you know, this table with the right kind of uh, ranking, that's it. That approach took got a lot of traction, was a hit with the, all the stakeholders, and that was the one we eventually went to. Right? So this is very, very critical. Understand the context, the surroundings, the consumers, uh, all the constraints, and then come with something up. And that's your solution. But does that uh, affect your appraisal because you didn't work hard? <laughs> In fact, I will. I, I can. That my argument here is to, to come up with something which is simple, right? It takes far more effort. Yeah. Coming up with a like, let's say, a simple uh, table which shows you the right metric in the right way with the right comparison. So that it is also analytically or data science perspective strong. It is also interpretable by people. That is one of the most challenging things, really. So no, it is that, very, very that, easy. that you can I understand, but like to somebody <laughs> coming from outside, you just built a table for in two months is what they will see and tell. Yeah. <laughs> Interesting thing, by the way, uh, in, my table took six months. So, so <laughs> that's, that's that. So, you know, but yeah, but this is, but you're right, you're right about this, that uh, the perception, uh, perception is that Many, at least many people, many consumers think that uh, unless it is complex, it is not yeah. maybe worth worth the, the worth the effort or attention or whatever, right? But that's some misconception which has to go away. But 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 you know, like I said, um, uh, this perception probably would be there in many young analyst data scientists. Yeah. Uh, in my experience, whoever uh, say stakeholders I've spoken to, right, whether it is business folks or product folks, right, uh, or even uh, leadership in analytics or data science teams, they, they really appreciate solutions like this because sure. they understand to act on something, there are certain requirements it needs to meet. And something which is simple and elegant and parsimonious and easy to maintain is definitely preferable over something, some, some big complex machine you have built. 
Sure, sure. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think there's a saying that uh, it's a pretty famous saying which says, uh, I wrote you a long letter because I didn't have uh, the time to write you a short letter. So, <laughs> so sort of, sort of uh, something like that. Uh, yeah, I think really great points there on how to uh, find the right solution. And I think some of the points you mentioned on constraints, right? Like uh, some of these come from problem framing itself. So while you're, yeah. when you're trying to frame the problem, yes. uh, you are able to really find out the constraints that you can use in your solutions as well. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, yeah, re really, really great points there. Um, I think, do you want to take questions now that are popping yeah. up? or do we, uh, no, That's a good time to take questions, I suppose. Uh, okay, so there, there is a question <laughs> on by Hari. The, this explainable AI ML, will it be a temporary thing until AI ML picks up and business gets comfortable with? Will this trend limit the implementations? So because the explainability interpretability part came, yeah. So the question is, like, do you think this is a temporary thing or do you think this is going to pick up? No, in fact, in my mind, uh, this is something which should get more attention. Right? Uh, you, especially for platforms which have significant reach and potential impact. Um, even if, if you take the example of India, right? There are so, so many platforms. Think of the Flipkarts or, or the Mintras or Jamong and so much, right? Uh, if it, this could be uh, touching lives of several, several lakhs of people, crores of people, really, right? And uh, think about things like convenience, think about things like uh, financing and so on, right? All of these things, if there are some biases or discrimination which you are just getting in, right, in the data without realizing it, this is, this is not, this, is, this should be a deal breaker, really. Uh, you know, no company should be comfortable going ahead with a with a model which actively discriminates. Okay, the the the, the challenge is that uh, no company really wants to discriminate. Of course, nobody really likes that. No company would be happy to do that. But we don't really still have all the skill sets, or it's not popular enough so far. So companies are not really auditing the models. Right? Sure. Companies are not really investing in explaining the model. Some companies are, of course. Yeah, you know, the Googles, yeah, the IBMs, even Uber for that matter, they have built plenty of solutions around this. It's a big topic. It's yeah. very, very hot right now. Uh, and uh, this will only pick up pace. I don't think that, uh, this will end. Rather, we should all be talking about it much more than right now. Sure. I think bias, like you said, is a big issue, uh, especially yeah. in data sets and in the models that are incorporating yeah. it, right? So Definitely. I think that that is something that a lot of companies are talking about. Yeah. Uh, and maybe let's move on to the next question that I had for you. Like you've worked in a lot of e-commerce companies mm -hmm. and uh, what are some problems in commerce that you have seen and solved? Uh, some examples that you can share with us. Uh, okay. Actually, <laughs> I've been working in e-commerce for six years now and I was one of the fortunate ones who worked across different aspects of it. So I've worked in uh, for the marketing side, I've worked for the uh, catalog side, the text part, which is reviews and ratings and user questions and so on. It's, it's across and really hard to really enumerate sure. them. But I can say that uh, if I think of larger problem areas as such, not problems specifically, larger problems areas I've worked with are, uh, let's say the, the whole reviews and ratings part is one, where this is, in general, it was about figuring out you know, the reviews, the quality of them, the relevance of them, the ranking, uh, what should be ranked, are they informative enough and whatnot, right? Or cleaning up or deduplication of questions and so on, right? Uh, then I also spent a good amount of time in the, in the, uh, in the category side, which is uh, essentially working the categories to, uh, to figure out uh, what, what, let's say, the target base for the next marketing communication should be or you know uh, who which which are the best customers let's say, segments in a way uh, or how their performance is or what should be the right metric in for that matter maybe it's making some forecast for them and so on so a lot of stuff really uh, over, over this duration and then pricing is another area where i have worked in pricing uh, it was more about uh, quantifying the impact of certain pricing related decisions we make right if we price this way versus that other way um, is this better is that better does it affect the long-term behavior, better short-term behavior, and so on? So many, many problems, really. Sure. There are plenty of things to work on uh, in, in the e-commerce context. And even if you don't think of the larger e-commerce context, even if you narrow down and focus on one small area, even let's say you're talking about just reviews and ratings for that matter, you have plenty and plenty of problems to solve, even in a small subdomain of this e-commerce. So it's, it's huge, really. 
and there's plenty for everyone to learn and uh, work on. Yeah. Sure. Again, I think maybe a related question on that when you talked about reviews and ratings, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, how do you quantify the impact of trying to work on reviews and rating? So something like that, right? We, we discussed mm -hmm. earlier about uh, trying to do problem solving and trying to have a measurable uh, metric yeah. where we say that, hey, this is if I do this, this is going to happen for the business. But yeah. if you keep going further uh, into problems that are distanced from, say, top, the top line or the bottom line, it becomes difficult to have a number to your, uh, to, your to your impact. So, uh -huh. so let's say maybe reviews or uh, ra rankings or ratings, right? Yeah. If you're working on that, how do you quantify the impact? Yeah, you are very correct about this, that uh, not everything has a clear impact on the top line or bottom line. Yeah. And there are many, many things. In fact, many things in between somewhere where it's not easy to quantify. And, uh, and this is, by the way, uh, something which many companies are now focusing on, you know, uh, this whole quantification of the ROI part. Uh, and this is where uh, I think, uh, again, integrating yourself into the strategy or integrating yourself into the business goals makes a world of difference. Sure. If you understood very well, so let's take the example of reviews and ratings, right? First question you ask is, are reviews supposed to increase say, revenue or the conversion of the custom for the customers? No, they are not, right? What is it really for? What is the objective of your product? So this is this question is actually not just a question for analytics or data science. In fact, this is a question which the product manager, product owner needs to answer. Mm -hmm. That's where it starts. And analytics and PMs or analysts of business together need to figure it out. Align that, okay, this is the intended behavior I want to impact. The second part is, can you uh, associate or can you somehow uh, related to the, the key business KPIs. So for example, is it increasing the monthly active users? Is it increasing the revenue somehow? Is it increasing their lifetime value? You have to link your product or your solution, whatever, to one of these key KPIs, which business understands. Sure. Unless you do that, it won't work. Uh -huh. So that's, the, that's really the, the key. Make sure you spend enough time in linking your product success to one of these key KPIs then it works out. Sure. Yeah, uh, I think that's an interesting way to quantify the impact of what you're doing, uh, especially when it's far away from the yeah. top line or the bottom line. OK, so I think that brings us to the end of the first section of our discussion, uh, which is more about business problem, uh, understanding the business problem and trying to find solutions. Uh, the second part is more towards uh, how can we go ahead and build a career in data science. Uh, mm. And this is this is more uh, towards your journey, trying, trying to understand what you've done so far, what what you think has worked for you, what you think you shouldn't, uh, you've done that has, mm. you shouldn't have done what you've done and, and vice versa. So so tell, tell, take us through what, what you've been through so far. My journey as such, yeah. 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 I think it could be interesting to many folks, uh, especially those who did not start in a computer science uh, degree okay so i'll maybe i'll share my screen i made a nice sure uh, I think for it. It. present to audience <laughs> button. yes yes yeah um, i think you should be uh, on the see. rest of the question and answers i'll take those at the end i mean let me just uh, finish this part and then i can take the other questions yeah so, can you see my screen now yes i can see your screen so there is a slide with multiple visuals uh -huh. over there right yeah <laughs> all right okay so this is actually my journey and I'll, I'll talk of this right and um, it's, put, it's my effort in putting this together, but yeah, I, okay. So I started, as you can see on the left, right? I started uh, as an electronics in engineer. And the first company I joined was a semiconductors company. I was in the role uh, somewhat like some, some somewhat close to an application engineer. It's a very, very different, very uh, electronics. It was a core job actually. It was a pretty good company, by the way. And it's still like a dream job for many. That's where I started. Very soon realized I cannot continue. That's not for me. And uh, I felt that for me, at least, uh, it's important to be solving problems, right? Uh, looking at multiple things, not limiting myself to one thing, but rather being able to work across different problems. And therefore, I felt that point in time that consulting is something I can go towards. Okay. So I tried to get into consulting companies like ZS, I mean, ZS is what I joined. 
and uh, the reason I chose consulting really was that uh, I didn't really think at that point in time that you know data science or whatever. Uh, I wanted to solve problem, you know? uh, and once I got in, right, I was in the role of a analytics uh, consultant kind of a role, and that's where my exposure to data started. I I saw this that you know uh, in the business big 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 meetings, all right. Someone who has the right data and like, presented in the right format is able to completely influence the decision. Right? That's where I saw the power of data, and that's where I also got a lot of hands-on exposure to this whole data. We didn't call it data science back then, but this whole uh, data thing and statistical modeling and so on. And uh, post that, I wanted a little more exposure across international markets, so I joined uh, IQVIA, IMS Health. It was at point in time and uh, was there again for a few years, this time working across uh, geographies for uh, US for a while, net, uh, for, for a lot of European nations, uh, UAE markets and so on. So a lot of different markets, got plenty of exposure. And then I felt, okay, I want to learn a little more, uh, higher scale. I joined Flipkart in 2015 and I was there for quite some time. Uh, in, this, this, in this whole, in the between joining Flipkart and so on, uh, I've been, actively involved in a lot of learning, a lot of teaching. I uh, also taught on various platforms, like I mentioned, all the major platforms really. Uh, I also got a chance to author a book on deep learning. And this this was thank thankfully because of the experience I had with Flipkart around the whole tech stuff, right? And then uh, after that, 2020, this year, beginning, I joined Zalando in January. And I've been here for, you can see, right? Five, five years, five months now, sorry. Um, close to six months now yeah but and then finally i also have this uh, a second book which is data science or marketing analytics again which is thankfully coming from my experience so far so that's my journey uh, as you can see it started off uh, in electronics it didn't immediately move to a data science kind of a role it still is not called a data scientist right now by the way but uh, it is definitely a, a data based problem solver kind of a role yeah, sure. So yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> very, very interesting journey. Uh, I also was an electronics engineer uh, right after my bachelor's, worked in a big company, which is uh, into core electronics. But then again, I've, I've, I did my master's after that, and that allowed me to move towards this area. So oh, right. my master's was my trigger point. I, your, your trigger point was perhaps ZS, uh, if, if, <laughs> if yes. I see yeah, your movement towards uh, data related mm -hmm. uh, jobs. Yeah. Okay, so the next question is, uh, what is the one thing that you wish you had done earlier in your career? Oh, it's a good one. One thing I wish I had done earlier in my career. Yeah, so there's one thing which I'm doing a little more now, mm -hmm. but I would definitely see the value of it already. And I believe it would have helped me tremendously is within my organization, uh, right? Find someone who is willing to mentor you. Mm -hmm. I'm not talking about you know, reaching out people on LinkedIn and ask for general general, gyan, general philosophy, right? That's not what I mean. Someone within your organization uh, close to what you do will have a far better understanding of your situation, your constraints, your environment, and they will really be able to tell you what it takes to succeed in that environment. So sure. finding someone who is uh, who has done well in your organization, in your similar role, and asking them to mentor you, that's something I should have done before. I didn't do it uh, until very late, I think, too late. But yeah, still, uh, it's never too late. Just start doing this right away. Finding mentors in the organization that can help you. In the organization, yes. OK. And how important do you think are communication skills in the data-related jobs? Oh, wow. So this, in fact, this kind of brings me to this whole thought process right about what really should matter for data scientists right? Uh, in this whole uh, um, Right now, there's so much going on, so much uh, noise, right? And somehow people seem to be focusing on certain things and ignoring some other things. Communication is one of those. Really, really matters a lot. And you, you see, right, it's not just about uh, telling your manager that this is what I've done. That's not communication. That's not where it ends, right? That's not even the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. You need to be able to communicate to, first of all, understand the problem itself. You need to be able to communicate to explain your approach, your uh, you know constraints, right? Your considerations. You need to be able to 
say communicate your findings and outcomes your yeah. recommendations as well right this is something which is so missing i mean i can think of one example which was kind of a surprise you know i i so i was in a consulting environment for 5 5 and a half years and there you know client and communication is like very given a lot of importance right so you don't go wrong over there you focus on communication a lot you make sure it is interpreted by the other person and i was coming to that environment then i came to this non non consulting organization and i saw an analyst presenting to the business team some result of an analysis it was actually a model the person was inspected and on the slide there was a slide and on the slide there was directly the output from an r package for regression okay so so, so logistic regression there were some 11 or 12 variables their uh, beta values the standard beta whatever the confidence intervals and three stars or whatever and then chi square walled deviances and that is something even many analytics folks don't understand right why in the world would you show it to a business team even though the analysis was good but the the analyst ended it on a slide with this right mm. with this with this effect size or whatever question was how to and someone really asked right what is this i don't understand this how what is the recommendation and discussion went into then you know someone is supporting and so on it became that, okay from this you actually need to see that these are the positive ones and so these are what what to focus on and so on and that was a big four point my mind it, that should be always avoided right? you know communication skill is a very critical had it been the other way that the analyst had uh, shown the model in a very different manner uh, talked only of the effects this is what we see from the model this is what we recommend to you eventually would have gone in a very different direction right so that is a big big thing uh, in the interest of time i mean like once one example over here again there was another instance where uh, i was um, Uh, part of this larger project and there was a very senior data scientist okay and uh, there were business teams were talking to again and some of them were merchandisers okay and he was trying to trying to show that uh, show and show a graph and trying to show that you know these kind of errors are more happening in this having more in this segment versus the other and so on and he just made this bar chart with multiple bars and nobody had a clue what he was showing and again they were all blank and something which could have been a 2 minute thing uh, this year a scientist spent 20 odd minutes just trying to explain what the graph was and as you can imagine the effectiveness of this thing was lost right? yeah. this is actually pretty critical skill in my mind and this includes the whole uh, thing about visualization really mm. is, I, i can never stress the importance of this enough sure i mean yeah everyone uh, knows of that that technical guy who can't talk right like there, there is somebody yes. <laughs> who's in the organization always but i think it's a skill that people can develop i mean it's not something that uh i mean it's often not taught as yeah. as a skill set that you can learn but it's something that you can develop with uh, practice deliberate practice is what i feel Definitely. okay interesting examples there so again i think i think you answered this question but maybe i can just ask you if you have any other points to add to this so what do many developing or aspiring data scientists get wrong about their preparation so one is communication they don't focus on that but what else do yes. they so i think uh, it, it it is in a way could be a summary of what we've been talking right to a large extent uh, which is uh, data many data science folks or data science aspirants right they focus on the technical part way too much right they somehow they feel that that is everything right that that that, that the model or whatever is the main thing in in their mind what i don't get is this whole modeling thing is one small part of this whole problem solving uh, effort right and uh, like i said right uh, understanding the business communication um, you know these are very very important skill sets right other than that there are some other these these uh, things like uh, um, like having a mindset which is uh, more statistical in nature right i mean there's a lot of uncertainty in business what do i make of this is this significant or not these kind of things right yeah. there's many many things beyond your technical skills which you need to focus on sure and that's what many people are missing in fact like i said earlier right many companies now have a round for business problem solving where they test just this you know if mm. i give you a problem how will you go about solving it and if the first answer you give to me is that uh, you i'll make a i'll make a deep learning model for this that's a red flag really in my mind at least so you know don't do that 
uh, approach it systematically, step by step, uh, solving a problem, not not force fitting your model everywhere, right? Whatever you know, <laughs> that's 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 what I really think. Um, is people, people are getting it very wrong. Focus on many other things. I mean, this is just one part of it. Make sure you have a technical basics right, but make sure you're able to communicate well. Make sure you're showing the right attitudes, right? And there's many many things you need to do, and not just a model. Okay. Which brings me to the last question that I have uh, for you today, which is basically what are the skill sets required to succeed and grow in the data science and analytics industry? All right, succeed and grow. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm. All right. So well, let's say once you're in a data science role, or let's say you're working on it, right? I think uh, trying to get into data science roles or whatever, right? Um, so what you need to succeed and grow they could be divided into some categories, I suppose. Mm -hmm. The more hands-on, the more uh, technical, hard skills would probably be, I would say, very, very important is the whole data handling part. Probably uh, SQL uh, or, or you know, whatever setup is there in the, your organization, in a way, right? Or target organization or domain, in a way. But SQL definitely is, is critical, right? So data handling skills, basically, using SQL or whatever, Python or whatever it is that matter. doesn't really matter too much. But yeah, data handling. Then you should also have this uh, statistical mindset, which I kind of hinted to, Yeah, yeah. which is essentially, you just look at this number uh, moving, <laughs> you know, this change to this. Is it is it significant? Should we bother? Should we care? Right? How do I quantify uh, the impact, uncertainty, all of those things, right? Uh, you should have this kind of mindset because this will el help you eliminate a lot of the noise mm -hmm. and help you focus on what really matters. Uh, third thing is uh, the technical skills, I would say club them into a single thing, you know, like uh, whatever technical skills are relevant to your domain. So for example, if someone wants to be a product analyst, right, mm -hmm. uh, for them, uh, this whole A-B testing, hypothesis testing is, is a very important thing to have, it, right? Uh, you can't go without it. Or if someone wants to, let's say, work uh, around text very heavily, right? Then of course, text-related, uh, NLP-related stuff is very important to your domain, right? So, sure. uh, technical skills I would just not focus on them too much. They are just a means to an end, really. So that's that. Uh, on the softer side of things, like I said, the business problem solving is definitely a, a, a big one, and this uh, you just need to work on it, practice. Uh, look at case studies online, how different organizations are solving the same problem or whatever, but business problem solving is a really big one. Next is uh, this whole communication aspect, which I just mentioned, yeah. which is uh, uh, you know how you communicate the results of things, how you communicate your findings and insights. Uh, and this includes, say, uh, visualizing things the right way uh, in an impactful manner. And then uh, the third, and then this also behavioral thing really is uh, this thing about being open to learning, uh, uh, because even in in my eleven years of experience, things have changed tremendously. Yeah. You know, over the past eleven years itself, and a lot of changes, right? And had I been, uh, you know, happy with my own learning at that point in time, I wouldn't have been wherever I am, right? Uh, I mean, it's not much, but still, I feel I feel that okay, you know, I'm in the right direction. So unless I had had that open mind. Keep, just keep learning, keep upskilling. Mm -hmm. uh, it would have been very, very difficult for me to even survive. So this, I think, is a very, very important skill because every single year, every two years, you will feel that uh, the underlying, the way you work in an organization is also changing. The tech stack is keeping on changing. The way your models or the way the scale of data, the way you access, everything is just keeping on changing. You have to keep learning and evolving. Sure. Okay, uh, with that, I come to an end. All of my, all of my questions are done. Uh, let's take a look if there are questions from the audience. Yeah, sure. There's one question from Vivek. How do you find time for so many things like managing work, <laughs> teaching, writing books, and so on? Oh, wow, okay. So, um, the, the way I find time for this is that I have made it a big priority in my life to uh, spend time on the things I like doing besides work. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, the things you, you talked about, right, are things I like doing. So it never feels like extra effort. It's, it's in fact, it's relaxing sometimes, you know, uh, writing something is in fact relaxing and uh, pleasing to me. So you just, you could say it's a, it's a hobby and you never feel exhausted by the hobby. So, and, and of course, this is also, is also possible only if you have very clear boundaries set, right? Uh, 
this is the work time and that's that right and there is this time for my own stuff there is time for family and so on so you have to make sure one is not creeping into the other and that's the only way i think it works there's many approaches to this other people have very different views but this is the view which i hold and it works for me okay we will mark that as answered <laughs> we'll take the next question couple of questions there are a lot of folks working on ai ml in india why do we not see many people creating algorithms for indian stock markets <laughs> uh, I, it's interesting question uh, although i don't think i am the best to answer this but from little knowledge uh, i do have i think there are plenty of uh, people trying this plenty of algorithms yeah. and everything uh, but i think um, i mean this is again this is just a i'm complete novice in this matter right stock markets and so on i don't think uh, this, this, this is an area which can be done uh, solved in the same way there's just too much going on right too many yeah. variations too much going on and uh, i don't know people, there are solutions by the way but i don't know yeah. what the efficacy of those are and and by the way i mean just as in i mean i don't know maybe you can correct me if i'm wrong but i think uh, algorithmic um, trading at least internationally maybe india also it's there but it is is already driving a significant volume of yeah. the, the transactions right yeah maybe it is already there for india i'm just not very sure of this one sure okay uh okay i'll take the next question from hari quickly second if we have so to solve the real estate prediction problem in india how do we proceed considering low data oh this is, seems a very specific maybe, question. maybe we can take this later yeah uh yeah. Okay, maybe off the topic, but your take on it will be helpful to learn something new. There are plenty full resources online. Uh, how do you pick trustworthy resource? Yes, yes, this is this is important, and this is um, this is why this is the reason. This plenty of options is the reason why many people just start off and they're never able to complete it. What people do, especially when they want to learn, is let's say I want to learn a particular topic. Let's say I want to learn about say PCA for that matter. what people do is you look online you find 10 different links to save their all the 10 links then you save some five youtube videos you also find a course which has this there is this overload you don't stick to any of them you try different things you give up and so on you never really get anywhere uh the key in my mind or what has been working for me is spend your time to choose one resource but once you have chosen it don't stray from it until you have completed and in terms of resources right uh, blogs and videos or whatever there are plenty different different people different things work what seems to work best for me is books uh, you read them in your own time you think you pause uh, you know it's, it's a very different kind of an engagement with a book uh, you know and uh, take a good book spend time on it while you're doing it right unless you have some very good questions or you don't stray from it you focus on it work on it try the examples or whatever and that's really i think uh, what you should do after you're done with the resource after you exhausted that resource then you go towards the others otherwise again it doesn't really get you anywhere and how do you pick trustworthy resources um i this is again individuals have very different uh, approaches right but social validation is social proof is a good idea in this case if there are books with other people's are liking or people feel it's helpful for them and if the people who like it are similar to you in temperament then maybe you will like it as well right so maybe go with that kind of an approach but yeah take your time to figure it out what you like and then don't stray from it that's that's my uh, answer for you you basically described how recommender system works but okay let's move <laughs> on to the next question how is the rise of auto ml features as you say is make it going to impact traditional ml engineers as most of the things are going to get automated uh, yeah okay so i think uh, this this impacts many people right it's not just uh, traditional ml engineers it is also impacting uh, many people who are right now in data science roles it impacts many business analysts product analysts people as well right and uh, and really this right this having uh, Uh, your models entire whatever like modules plug and play modules right is really i think the future i mean i uh, there will be limited situations uh, in which you will have very very specific very very contextual kind of um, a lot of hand crafting of things but this this trend that we see of auto ml is is here to stay right it won't completely take over but 
it will be it is here to stay and for a very long for a very, very big proportion of use cases will be handled by this right so um, so it is just something you have to figure out you know how it impacts your work stream uh, whether as a data scientist or data or business analyst or product analyst or an engineer and just uh, be prepared to uh, have a setup where this will be a part of where you coexist with this you there's no competition i mean it's there you will be working along with it alongside and you, it, the key would be identifying maybe you know uh, which of these solutions uh, these uh, auto ml solutions will work uh, and that's the easier things i mean in fact why would you even want to spend time on those right yeah. better give these away to these simple one these are simple ones they are not really fun after a while honestly after a while making models is not so much fun and then it after for several years it is boring really <laughs> the, the important part is the design part the fun part is designing so you'll uh, just give the modeling part to one of these modules but you spend your time on designing design uh, thinking about the outcome thinking about the recommendation and so on right that's how you should think about this sure thing yeah i think we've taken all questions the last one is just a comment mm -hmm. uh and yeah with that we come to an end of the session today uh, thank you so much rahim for taking the time uh, you, if you have any closing remarks now is the time yes uh yeah one closing remark which is somewhat a summary of the things we discussed which is as someone i mean if if you are someone who is looking to get into this whole uh, data role or who is someone who is very early into the role already uh please also work beyond the technical part also work on things like communication and problem solving skills these skills will be your key differentiators and will be the difference between just another data scientist versus you know a great one so please focus on that and yeah that's that's all i have to say okay. <laughs> in case you have any uh, comments or questions you can feel free to reach out to me on linkedin and maybe just yes, send me a message sure okay yeah you can uh, reach out to rahim on linkedin and uh, thank you so much everyone for joining today it was uh, really great having everyone uh, on the session and uh, do join us next month for yet another mantis hat data science webinar all right thank you have a good evening if you're in india and wherever you are thank you thank you Bye. everyone all the best